ഇരുപത്തൊന്നാം നൂറ്റാണ്ട് ജനിതക വിപ്ലവത്തിന്റെ നൂറ്റാണ്ടായിട്ടാണ് വിലയിരുത്തപ്പെടുന്നത് മനുഷ്യ ശരീരത്തിൽ ഏതാണ്ട് മുപ്പത്തയ്യായിരം ജീനുകൾ ഉണ്ടെന്നാണ് കണ്ടെത്തിയിരിക്കുന്നത് മനുഷ്യന്റെ ജനിതക രഹസ്യങ്ങളുടെ ചുരുളഴിച്ച് ജീവന്റെ പുസ്തകം വായിച്ചെടുക്കുക എന്ന ഉദ്ദേശത്തോടെ ആയിരത്തി തൊള്ളായിരത്തി തൊണ്ണൂറിൽ ആരംഭിക്കുകയും രണ്ടായിരത്തി മൂന്നിൽ പൂർത്തിയാവുകയും ചെയ്ത പ്രോജക്റ്റാണ് പദ്ധതിയാണ് ഹ്യൂമൻ ജിനോം പ്രോജക്ട് ആ ഹ്യൂമൻ ജിനോം പ്രോജക്ടിന്റെ കമേഴ്സ്യലൈസേഷനെ പറ്റിയിട്ടായിരിക്കും ഇന്ന് ഇവിടുത്തെ ഇവിടുത്തെ ഊന്നുന്നത് എന്ന് ഞാൻ മനസ്സിലാക്കുകയാണ് ഇപ്പോൾ ഒരു ജീവിയിലെ പാരമ്പര്യ സ്വഭാവങ്ങളുടെ വാഹക തന്മാത്രകളാണ് ജീനുകൾ ജിനോമിക്സ് ജീൻ എഡിറ്റിങ് ജനറ്റിക് എൻജിനീയറിങ് എന്നുള്ള വാക്കുകളെല്ലാം തന്നെ ഇന്ന് പൊതുസമൂഹത്തിന് വളരെ പരിചിതമാണ് ഏതെങ്കിലും ഒരു ചിക്കിങ്ങിൽ കയറി നമ്മൾ ചിറകുകളില്ലാത്ത കോഴികളെ കൊണ്ടുണ്ടാക്കിയ ഭക്ഷണം കഴിക്കുമ്പോൾ നാം അറിയാതെ തന്നെ ജിനോം ടെക്നോളജിയെ കുറിച്ച് അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ജിനോം എൻജിനീയറിങ്ങിനെ കുറിച്ച് അവബോധമുള്ളവരായി തീരുകയാണ് അപ്പൊ ഇനിയുള്ള കാലം ജിനോമിന്റെ വളർച്ച നമ്മുടെ മരുന്നുകൾ ഉണ്ടാക്കുന്ന കാര്യത്തിൽ രോഗ രോഗ സംഹാര ശേഷിയുള്ള മരുന്നുകളും അതുപോലെ തന്നെ മനുഷ്യന്റെ ഭക്ഷ്യോൽപ്പന്നങ്ങളും എല്ലാം ഉണ്ടാക്കുന്നതിൽ വിപ്ലവകരമായ പരിവർത്തനങ്ങൾ വരുത്താൻ പറ്റിയിട്ടുള്ള ഒരു ശാസ്ത്രശാഖയെ പറ്റി അതിൻ്റെ ഏറ്റവും പുതിയ വിവരങ്ങൾ നൽകാൻ കഴിയുന്ന ഒരു വെബിനാറാണ് ഇവിടെ നടക്കാൻ പോകുന്നത് ഈ വെബിനാറിന് നേതൃത്വം കൊടുക്കുന്ന ജിഷ ടീച്ചർ ലതാ സദാനന്ദൻ ടീച്ചർ നിഷ എ പി തുടങ്ങിയിട്ടുള്ള അധ്യാപകരെ അഭിനന്ദിച്ചുകൊണ്ടും ഈ മുഖ്യ പ്രഭാഷണം നടത്തുന്ന ഈ വെബിനാറിന്റെ പ്രധാനപ്പെട്ട ആകർഷണ കേന്ദ്രമായ കിരൺ നായർ സാറിനെ കൊല്ലം ശ്രീനാരായണ കോളേജിന് വേണ്ടി ഞാൻ ഒരിക്കൽ കൂടി സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്തുകൊണ്ടും എന്റെ ചെറിയ ഭാഷണം അവസാനിപ്പിക്കുന്നു നന്ദി നമസ്കാരം ജിനോമിയോളജി So I'm not going to go into any further details, but uh, most of you might have had a chance to sit through Dr. Amrita's presentation this morning. So that was definitely a highlight with CRISPR technology. And what I'm going to be talking to you today is genome editing technologies in general and how they can be commercialized. So when we talk of genome editing or genome engineering, that definitely you might have heard of it. And it's just a manipulation of the genetic code of organisms. Uh, you know, there is a complete set of genes which form the genome. They are actually a specific set of nucleotides and they are arranged in a particular order. But any changes to this arrangement naturally results in a mutation. Uh, currently all of us even a layman is aware of what mutation is because we have been hearing of it since the covid have started like the strains have changed there have been like changes in uh, the genetic makeup of the organism so that is a mutation but when we induce changes to this arrangement of our, or the set of nucleotides that is what we call as gene editing or genome engineering 
And obviously this can be used for health and economic benefits for human welfare, animal welfare, plant welfare, anything. And the major goal of genome engineering or gene editing is to more rapidly achieve goals when we are comparing it to traditional or conventional technologies. If we move, in to move through the history or the chronology of how these uh, technology developed, it all started with the discovery of the DNA double helix in 1953, which you all might be aware of. And in 1972, the first ever recombinant DNA was created by uh, a set of scientists. And the 1980s and 90s saw advancements in these technologies with um, Thomas Wanger in 1981. He was the first person to deliver a gene from rabbit into mouse and thereby creating a transgenic animal. In in 1982, there was uh, the first ever genetically engineered drug, as you all know, it's insulin, and insulin was the first ever genetically engineered drug, uh, which was developed in 1982. And with the advent of the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, in 19, um, it was probably 1983, uh, I think, yeah. Uh, so in 1983, with the advent of PCR, it even gave more platform and it paved way to more research possibilities with the help uh, within genome engineering or gene editing. As uh, our principles are pointed out, the, the 1999 and 2000s saw a major leap in this technology with the Human Genome Project uh, coming into existence. And it, it, it ran through the decade wherein all the genes of the human uh, genome was, was mapped. Even now, in this era, like 2017, 18, 19, there has been like really good progress in uh, genome engineering technology. So in 2012, CRISPR, or what we have heard from Dr. Amrita this morning, CRISPR in general came into existence and it's still an advancing field of genome engineering. But we all have heard of like genetic modification. Anything that, anything that causes change to the gene or genome of an organism is genetic modification. But what actually is a genetically modified organism and what actually is a gene edited organism? Are there any differences between a genetically modified organism? Of course, we could argue like gene editing is a genetic modification, but what actually is the difference between a gene, genetically modified organism and a gene edited organism? Well, when we talk of a genetically modified organism, it, it can be distinguished by a novel or a desirable trait. A trait which is encoded in heritable genetic information or say DNA for, of an organism. And then that will be a novel combination of genetic ex experiment, uh, uh, sorry, genetic material, which, is a, which cannot be achieved by traditional breeding process. So uh, we may say like a traditionally bred cattle, for example, Will, will be absolutely different. Like oh, th there will be obvious differences between a normally traditionally bred cattle and a genetically modified cattle. So that is a genetically modified organism. There will be a novel desirable trait and it, it can be distinguished. If I can give you a few examples, one is a BT cotton, which you all might have heard of. Like in India, BT cotton is still in existence. And people all around the world are using those BD cotton. It's a genetically modified organism where uh, cry genes from an organism is in, in, integrated into the uh, uh, plant to give it pest resistance, which makes it a GMO because it has a foreign gene existing in it. Another example is the Equa Bounty, Equa Advantage Salmon. So if you see the figure, uh, uh, the, the diagram, you can, you can see that there are two fishes. One is a bigger one, which is an Equa Bounty Salmon or an Equa Advantage Salmon, which is the first and only GM animal still available in market. It's been approved in Canada and the US and it's available in the market. Whereas comparing to a normal salmon, it has lesser pigmentation and it's larger in size. And it carries a gene Interspecies, sorry, intraspecies gene. So, a, a different species of salmon carries a gene which can actually cause the fillet or the muscles to grow, which results in high, like larger fillet. So that's how these fishes are developed. So it carries an a, a gene which is intraspecific, but it's from a different organism. 
But when, when you consider gene editing, a gene edited animal or gene editing in particular introduces small changes into genes to make them like other gene variants that occur in the same species, but it leaves no observable change footprint or residue within the organism. So a gene edited animal will carry only its own genome. It will never have a transgene. It will never have any other genes from any other organism. It's just an editing that's happening to its own genome. Gene editing can be used to make changes indistinguishable from the results of natural breeding event, which means that you, you might see a naturally bred organism and you might have a, a gene edited organism. You could visibly make no difference between this. So phenotypically, they might be similar, but genotypically, they are different with genes knocked out or shut down. I can give you examples for gene editing uh, in animals. One is chicken which lays more eggs or chicken which have like more meat. It, it doesn't seem to be different from a normally bred chicken or a normal egg laying chicken, but the gene edited organism will have the potential to lay more eggs or maybe uh, be more uh, large when compared to uh, normally bred chicken. Another example is cattle. So uh, we'll be seeing all of this in detail later, but polled cattle or hornless cattle is one of the gene edited cattle where cattle will be born without horns and th that can be helpful uh, in dairy industry. We'll see how it is in, in, in a few moments. So what actually are the tools that are used in gene editing? One of the tools we have seen this morning is CRISPR, but what are the other tools that we use in gene editing? You all know restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes are the natural editors. Uh, you, you, you have learned about uh, endonucleases or exonucleases, which are just enzymes that cleaves the uh, genetic material, that's DNA or RNA. But these restriction enzymes are natural editors. They, they have their own sequences for, and they is, they're site specific, they're sequence specific, they cut the g g gene within, within the genome. But are there any other uh, engineered kind of nucleases? Yes, the answer is yes, we have. One of them is sync finger nuclease, which is eukaryotic in origin. They are actually a class of engineered DNA binding proteins, which obviously facilitate targeted gene editing in the genome. So they, they, they are used for targeted editing within the genome, which creates uh, breaks within the double-stranded DNA. And the thing is we as scientists or users can specify where these uh, edit editing should happen. So sync finger nucleases have, is designed of a sync finger protein, which is cleaved to a FOC1 restriction enzyme, which we'll see in the next slide and they cleave uh, DNA at user-specified locations. The second kind of uh, tools which are used for gene editing is talons, or they are called as transcription activated like effector nucleases or talons, which are prokaryotic in origin. Unlike sync finger nucleases, which are eukaryotic in origin, talons are prokaryotic. These talons are actually generated by fusing DNA binding domains of this transcription activator like effectors to a DNA cleavage binding domain, which also we'll see in the next slide. And obviously CRISPR-Cas9, which uh, Dr. Amrita has give, given a beautiful lecture this morning about. These CRISPRs are clustered regularly in the spaced short palindromic repeats, and they're unique, they're short, they might be like only uh, 22 to 25 base pairs in length, and they're palindromes which means they can be read uh, in both red directions and they'll be of the same sequence. And these are found in prokaryotic uh, genomes like bacteria and other prokaryotes. These CRISPRs need Cas9, which is a protein. It's a Cas base, which is an enzyme. And they act like a pair of molecular scissors. They, these Cas9 can cut the nuclease and they're directed by a set of sequence and these Cas9 can go and cut wherever we would like the DNA to be cut. So these thing finger nucleases, talents, CRISPRs, everything give us opportunity to like 
specifically or precisely edit genomes wherever we need. And CRISPR-Cas9 has been of great use. It's been a great revolutionary um, uh, invention or a discovery. So that was, that, that, that actually ran through uh, an entire decade and it, it actually gave scientists opportunities to explore within gene editing. It resulted in uh, Jennifer Dodna and Emmanuel Schapendier, Emmanuel Schapendier being awarded with the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020. So you can think how big the, uh, the discovery was and how big scientists would be using it for. So if we have a look at this slide, we do have, uh, so this is the DNA. We, we can see how these uh, talents that zinc finger nucleases or CRISPR works. This is the DNA, and these are the nucleus systems that act on this DNA. We have zinc finger nucleases, we have talents, and we have CRISPR-Cas9 systems, which uh, are the basic gene editing tools that we are talking about today. And here, these are the molecular scissors. Just like a ribbon is being cut by a scissor, here, the zinc finger protein together with the nucleus or the talent together with the FOC1 nucleus or the CRISPR with the Cas9 cuts the DNA wherever we require it to be. And if you look at a 3D model, this is how it looks like. So this here, we have the DNA here, we have the molecular scissors here, and we can specifically engineer proteins to go and cut wherever we would like the DNA to be cut. Now, that was just a general thing about how these genome engineering um, tools work. But what we're gonna talk today is about where would we apply these uh, genome engineering tools and how we can commercialize these tools and put up in it into the market. So, the first area of applying it is in agriculture, how we can apply it in agriculture. Of course, the genetically engineered animals for breeding, for layer industry or food industry, but how? One thing we could apply it for is to speed up plant and animal breeding by developing stable lines of crops and farm animals with the desired trait. How? For example, you, you need a plant which is resistant to herbicide. Yes, we can produce seeds with DNA which has been edited so that it just has herbicide resistance. So every uh, offspring that is developed from a plant will have the uh, gene edited uh, genome so that it expresses the uh, gene uh, herbicide resistance. Another example is poultry with advanced lines of poultry which are disease resilient or which can lay more eggs, which can be like, which can produce more meat or which are like featherless, uh, all these, uh, traits can be introduced into it. Another example is cattle where we have like massive cattle with huge uh, meat production so that they produce more meat when uh, that's helpful for beef industry or something. The second uh, application would be in uh, environment, how we, how we apply these gene editing technologies to environment. What, the, the, the first area where we could uh, apply gene editing in environment is to pet, uh, in the area of pets resistance. Rodents, termites, or rabbits, all these, uh, you would be interested to know like wild rabbits are pests in Australia. And they, they have been looking at like really good, uh, there are lots of scientists who have been looking at uh, ways to mitigate these uh, rabbits from the environment. So such pests, can pose a threat to agriculture or they can pose a threat to farm animal species, et cetera. So gene editing is an answer to pest resistance. Another area is invasive species. It would be funny, but in Australia, fish like carp and tilapia, which are being farmed in the Indian subcontinent and Southeast Asia, they are considered as pests. So tilapia and carp are pests here. And we have been working on projects which develop carp and tilapia biocontrol agents through gene editing so that they can be gotten rid of in the waterways of Australia. 
the same way with cane toads with invasive weed species, invasive crop species, beetles, weevils, and other insects, even mosquitoes and ticks uh, are being uh, worked on so that gene editing can be an answer to uh, develop biocontrol agents to mitigate them from the environment. Well, coming to the medicine and pharmaceutical industries, a massive revolution has happened in the medicine and pharmaceuticals since the advent of gene editing technologies because there have been development of allergen-free producers, uh, allergen-free medicines, allergen-free eggs, allergen-free plant products. And there have been uh, research going on to produce vaccines within egg whites. It, it would be interesting for you to know like, you, you can take a vaccine and, or you can take a pill and get rid of a disease, but it's more interesting when you can just eat an egg and get rid of a disease. So an egg which carries a vaccine, so the egg with the, the genome of the uh, organism will be engineered in such a way that the egg that, uh, that, an, that a hen lays will contain a vaccine it will be capable of producing a vaccine. And once you take that egg, that will be uh, incorporated with the vaccine, or even those eggs can be produced in a huge quantity and vaccines can be extracted from that and that can be delivered to um, human use. In testing drugs or medicinal devices, which are intended for human beings, any genome edited model animal can be developed so that drugs and medical devices which are intended for human use can first be tested on that. Like you can edit a mice genome and make it uh, uh, like a 99%. You know that mice genome is almost similar to uh, human genome. So you can even make editing inside a, a mice genome and test a medical device or a drug which is intended for human use first inside the mice and then deliver it to humans. These days, even genetic screening of patients are being done with the help of genome engineering or gene editing so that uh, any, any disease, disease carrying agent can be traced, it can be uh, manipulated, and it can be uh, addressed to. So these are just a few areas of uh, the wide scenario where we could uh, uh, apply gene editing to be it agriculture, be it environment, be it medicine or pharmaceuticals, wherever. So what I'm going to give you is our few examples of where we work on gene editing. So what are the commercially important gene edited animals we work with? Obviously we work with cattle, we work with sheep, we work with poultry organisms like uh, poultry anim animals like ch uh, chicken, quail, or even ducks. We have aquaculture species like farm, farm species or invasive species. And also we work with terrestrial and aquatic pests. So the first example I'm gonna give you is the production of homeless dairy cattle from genome edited cell lines. So all over the world, whether it be dairy industry or whether it be uh, meat industry, cattle with horns are not preferred. So cattle with horns, due to two reasons. One is the personal welfare. The animal handlers who work with it find it difficult to work with horned cattle and it may cause, uh, it may be cat catastrophic to the people who work with them. Second one is animal welfare where uh, a, a stock of animals can be injuring themselves if they are horned. So across the globe, almost all countries do dehorning of animals, dehorning of cattle, that they are, being cut off physically and they, the horns are removed from them. But this doesn't fall under the, what we call the so-called animal welfare. Considering animals having pain, yes, they do have. So dehorning can be addressed in another way. One way is through gene editing and how we do it, it's through the integration of the PC pole traits using talent technology or talent editing of fibroblast cells with HDR or what would we call as homology directed repair, followed by somatic cell nuclear transfer. So this has developed two different varieties of uh, uh, dehorned animals or polled animals, which is called as Podigy and Bury. Uh, these animals are alive, they're healthy, even at 12 months of age, but they'll be born genetically hornless. So any 
any cattle or any cattle offspring that's born to these animals will definitely be genetically harnessed. And it will be uh, surprising to know that dairy industry does more bee honing than the uh, meat industry, because in dairy industry, people are coming in constant contact with cattle and they definitely need the animals to be dehorned to protect themselves and the animals uh, within the sheds. So that's one example where gene editing can become handy, where you don't need to physically or brutally uh, do dehorning to the animals. They can easily be done through gene editing where no one is harmed. There is no introduction of any foreign genes into these animals. It's just taking off the uh, gene or switching off the gene, which causes the formation of horns. It's nothing to uh, lose, but we can gain. Another example is myostatin editing in cattle and sheep. So myostatin is a gene which is a negative regulator of muscle growth. So it prevents muscle growth. What we do is we could take sperm from a healthy bull, ovum from a healthy cow, and we can uh, do in vitro fertilization of those and then micro inject edited talents to it, like talents to it, which causes edit editing of these genes inside there. So our target will be myostatin gene inside the uh, zygote. And then this zygote will be micro injected with talents, which target these myostatin genes. So what these talents do is they go there, they bind to the DNA, they edit the myostatin gene, and it becomes non-functional. What happens? The myostatin gene doesn't work. What happens if the myostatin gene doesn't work? That, 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 that doesn't act as a negative regulator of muscle load, which results in uh, cattle or sheep with higher muscular volume, or you can see the the, the the figure here, the figure B shows like a normal bull compared to a myostatin edited bull, which has double the volume of muscle, which is obviously good for meat industry where we get larger volumes of meat from one, one organism. So these are examples of uh, sheep and cow that are myostatin edited, which definitely gives like four times more muscles or meat than a normal organism. The third example I'd like to give uh, is how we use genome engineering for sex selection in the layer industry. So layer industry or the egg industry is a massive industry across the world. And we know culling of male chicks or killing of males is one of the problems faced by this industry all over the world. You, you won't believe like 4 billion eggs are being, uh, sorry, 4 billion male chickens are being culled every year across the world in the layer industry. In Australia, we actually uh, see 8 million uh, female hens or chicks are required every year so that we can cater the needs of people to get enough eggs. So if we need uh, around 8 million eggs uh, every year, there, there should be 8 million new layer hens. And that if, if we need 8 million new layer hens, at least 16 million eggs should be hatched because we would say like 50% of them would be, it's a probability, like 50% of them would be male chicken, 50% would be female. So if we have 16 million uh, chicks hatched every year and half of them are males, those half goes into the bin directly, like they are, macerated or they are crushed in grinders and they are killed. So this is a major concern for animal uh, welfare people or animal activists, because most of the male chicks in layer industry are culled. So what can be done using gene editing? This is one of the uh, projects we have been working like really uh, enthusiastically. And this was one of the uh, projects that I worked when I was doing research within the university. So it was, it, it is interesting. We could go for precision genome engineering through two, two approaches. One is we can alter the sexual developments of males to generate functional females. Yes, that was what I was doing uh, all through my research work. We, we alter the genes of a male uh, chick or a male chicken 
and then we try and convert it or just alter it to a female so that it can become a functional female when it develops. So this is done within the egg stage. So once the embryo is formed and it hatches, it comes into a, comes out as a female. The second approach we could do is identify the male embryos before they are hatched so that they can be removed from the production line and it can be used for other purposes like maybe producing vaccines inside the eggs or something. But there are challenges, there are, uh, as with every, every other uh, uh, industry. Sexual development of genotypic males requires detailed knowledge of the sex determination. You need to identify what are the possible switches, what are the genes that causes, that makes male to be male and female to be female. And also uh, there'll be intervention of extra external or transgenic uh, uh, genes within that. The second one is identification of male embryos. You can incorporate a selectable marker to males and we can see that they are males. Like if, in, uh, if there is a fluorescent marker within the egg and all males are made to fluoresce green, the eggs will fluoresce green if they are male and they don't need to be hatched to uh, a bird to see whether it's male or female. In the egg stage, you can identify that, okay, these ones which fluoresce are males. So, Th that's a way to avoid any transgenes in females. So all the eggs that don't fluoresce, maybe green or red or whatever fluorescent protein you give it into, those will be females and those fluoresce, those eggs will be removed out of the production line and they never go into the animal stage. So these were like three small examples where we use gene editing to generate animals which are actually gene edited animals, but they are not a genetically modified animal, and they don't have they don't carry a gene from external uh, parties or a third party gene. It's their own genome. Now, uh, these technologies do exist in the research platform, and they do exist in the commercial platform. But what it takes to translate these research outcomes into commercialization. What, what, what are the uh, constraints that come into existence when we try to commercialize the research uh, in gene editing? Once a proof of uh, concept is established in the lab, it's easy to, easy to like translate it into a, a, a commercial platform, but what are the constraints or what are the criteria that we need to uh, keep in mind when we are, um, or I wouldn't say criteria, but considerations to be kept in mind when uh, we are moving into commercialization. Oh, by the way, this is just uh, uh, one of those chicken cell lines that we work with, which are green fluorescent, and they have a green fluorescent protein with it. So these are our um, test animals that we work with. Okay, so about commercialization, the first consideration is the intellectual property protection. So Every research is associated with some kind of intellectual property rights. And once you're commercializing this, it, it's, a, it's a concept that needs to be considered because uh, in, 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 if you consider in India or South Asian countries, there, there are no like really stringent rules to uh, go on this. But if we consider European Union, which has like really stringent rules, if you, if you if you if you consider US or the Australia Australia or um, the Indo-Pacific regions, they, they, they loosen up when it comes uh, uh, when it when it changes from region to region. So there are differences in IP protection regulations. In academic research, it's different. In industrial research, it's different. So when you take uh, something from an academic research or a research institute to industry, there is variation. There, there is a whole lot of variation in the uh, laws or rules or regulations that cover the IP. So as Dr. Amruza pointed out rightly this morning, that's, a, that's an area where you can uh, really excel in like protecting IP laws, uh, uh, policy, maker, policy making, all these are like uh, areas where biotechnologists can be, you, you need not do a research uh, degree for that. It's just, uh, a whole lot of different scene where you uh, learn laws, where you make policies, where you uh, govern these policies and stuff. So uh, 
I've just included this graph in here because it shows once, uh, so this shows the different uh, tools or genome editing tools like CRISPR-Sync meganucleases, the meganucleases talents, and the number of patents that were filed in the United States. So you can see once there was an advent of CRISPR in 2012, it has seen a, a alarmingly high rise in the patents that are filed in gene editing. So you can, you can imagine how important IP protection is when we are commercializing a research. The second thing is geographical location of the industry or the lab, I would say. The location of the produce, the established areas, the public acceptance based on the geographical location, all these are important when we are considering. So if, for example, if there is a pre-existing genome engineering industry in one region, people would definitely know that gene editing is something that's happening and they'll be more more than happy to welcome more research or more industry related things to such areas. Whereas when compared to some, some regions which doesn't have any knowledge of those or doesn't have a pre-existing uh, genome editing policy or genome editing industry, it would be really, really difficult to uh, squeeze into that space. And a large aggregation of academic and research activities, if it's, if it's happening at that place, that will be great. There will be a large consortium of people who knows about the research, and that will be easy for establishment of commercial purposes. And it's a fact. It's 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 a fact that in the U.S. there are like larger numbers of uh, uh, gene editing companies when compared to the European Union or the Asia Pacific matter. So geographical location is an important thing for commercialization, and obviously the gene editing market. That sorry, gene editing market. So research and development, it, it requires the large, the, the most amount of time when uh, we are putting some products in market, whether it be gene editing or a normal product, research and development takes the larger part of the time. And then it's been translated to production or large scale ma manufacturing. So th there has been a trend, like any genome editor agriculture products, for example, a food product, or uh, an allergen-free egg or a genome edited, whatever produce that is from agriculture, that's from plants, or maybe a poultry or animal product that for consumption could attract a widespread market when compared to human therapeutics, like maybe blood plasma or maybe uh, a drug or a pharmaceutical, whatever product that is, it will attract uh, lesser market when compared to the agriculture products because people are okay with a gene edited agri product which they could consume but they might not be okay with a medicine or a therapeutic uh, drug which is gene edited because they feel like it might interfere with your genome and it might cause something in there so the gene editing market is another factor to consider when we go into commercialization Next, next important fact with investment. Obviously, without investment, no R&D would move forward, no commercialization platform would work. There should be more and more input uh, in, well, 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 gene editing is actually a million dollar industry. The, the companies that we work with, the, the garments that put into it, it's a million dollar research and development industry. Huge, huge capital investments are required to, in production facilities and if we develop a consortium of different labs, if we develop a consortium of different people like-minded working on genome engineering, and then try to pull out these together, it would be much easier when compared to like people working in labs and then trying to spin out into ventures. But that that startups should also be helped, help for gene editing startup by pitching ideas to investors and investors putting in more money to slowly butt up these uh, startups for uh, gene, gene editing. So you can see as uh, in this graph, as years pass by, definitely there, are, there is more investment happening in this. The thing is for a research lab, what is important is the outcome, the R&D outcome. But when it comes into commercialization, what matters is what are the production costs and what market returns we get out from there. So whatever production cost is there for a gene edited animal, the market return should be 
uh, higher than that or even equal to that, they're happy to take it. So that's one other consideration that people should make. Then of course, the regulatory compliances. Do we have a universal regulatory compliance governing gene editor animal? No, we don't. Because there are differences in regulations in different countries. Even within countries, the, the states have different. So for example, in Australia, when I'm talking from an Australian perspective, the gene editing uh, policies that cover the Victorian government would be different to uh, another state. So a research that happens in Victoria cannot be sometimes uh, fulfilled in another state. So there should be a regulatory compliance and these regulatory compliance, the, reg the regulations are not universal. And obviously the, the important thing is ethical impact. People over often debate over like, is it okay to use gene editing? Who decides on this? Who decides on if gene editing is good or bad? There's a public aversion because people people don't even accept the fact that gene, genetically modified organism or a gene edited organism are totally different. A gene editor organism, when it doesn't have a foreign gene, it's just by itself. It's just like a normal animal. So it's a challenge to public uh, public uh, make people uh, make the public aware of like gene edited animal cell animal lines or gene edited products which are safer to use when compared to gene genetic modified organisms and obviously in uh, most of the places there are ethical religious and societal concerns and it links back to what i said the geographical location of the industry or the commercial uh, space where we go with the research is very important so these are some of the some of the what we say uh, considerations that we need to take when we are commercializing the uh, uh, the R and D in uh, genome engineering. And what what are the future what what future can we see into it? Well, when I say there is a huge role for ac academic institutions to develop commercial ventures. Yes, budding scientists are budding students. So people who are interested in genome engineering or genetic engineering should give should be given those opportunities. Okay. should be uh, gi given those uh, opportunities so that ventures can be developed, uh, even if it's small startups, it, it works. And research institutions definitely need to attract more investments from, uh, so you can go for like commercial companies and ask, ask them, uh, okay, I have a research proposal uh, and this is what uh, we would like to work with. How can I attract uh, more investments into it? Are you so the, there should be uh, there should be openings for students to uh, pitch their ideas and get get money for research or get scholarships and monies for um, money for research. And another one is pin out and buy buy ventures. What what what, what can be done there? Uh, you, budding scientists could pitch ideas and get get money to develop a spin out if you have a research outcome and how people would be like in a dilemma how do i get it into the commercial market yes there are uh bio venture capitalists who definitely put in money to your r d but the thing is yeah definitely you need to go and find them but what can be done in to change the entrepreneurial culture within the genome engineering market should it be broadened should people chase opportunities should there be more inclusiveness? Should there be universal um, uh, regulations that go on them? Can be many questions, but I leave it there for you to think uh, what, what future lies after hearing all the story of how gene editing can be helpful to uh, the human welfare, the animal welfare, and the environmental welfare. Anyway, that was... Uh, small talk of what uh, gene editing and genome engineering works having. I'd like to thank uh, the SN College team, uh, Dr. Asu Mutumar, the principal, and uh, Dr. Nisha Epi, the head of the department of Botany, Dr. Lada Sudandan, my sweet and lovely miss, um, Dr. S. Jisha, the coordinator of Agora, and all people who, uh, who have attended uh, this webinar, and especially the genome engineering team within uh, CSIRO's uh, Australian Center for Disease Preparedness, where as a budding scientist, I have like uh, spent most of the time researching on these things which you have heard. 
Thank you so much. And I'm happy to take questions if anybody has one. I haven't looked at the chats yet. There might be some. Thank you so much. Still no, no questions in the board. Hello. The question is there in the chat box by Dr. Preeta P.S. Chat, chat box, OK. Can CRISPR technology uh, help us in uh, to fight this COVID pandemic? Uh, Kiran? Yes, yes, of course. We we have been working, like there are many groups that have been working on it. Uh, so throughout the COVID pandemic, uh, so that was in a time when we could like experiment things because we wanted a result. Uh, suppose we wanted a vaccine as soon as possible. So that was in a time to like really experiment things. But obviously there are projects going on with CRISPR-Cas9 dealing with COVID-19 uh, virus and its mutant variants. Yes, definitely, there will be answers shortly. And there, I think there have been two papers which have been published where CRISPR-Cas9 has been used to, not, not only CRISPR-Cas9, but other Cas variants with CRISPR have been used to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes, so the answer is yes, it can be. But there is a long way to go. Hello, Mr. Kiran. It was a great talk. Thank uh, you. I'm biotechnology assistant professor. So I wanted yeah. to ask about a plant-based meat. So nowadays uh -huh. people, uh, people who are turning vegan, they want plant-based meat. They go for meatless meat. So can mm -hmm. gene editing improve such markets? Well, that's a good question, yeah. Uh, gene editing could, could, could improve such markets, yes. But how is a different story. Yes, gene editing could improve th those markets, but how is it's something yes. to be deliberated? More people about. are turning yeah. vegan. Yeah, right. if, even <laughs> everywhere in the world. In Australia, the number of vegans are increasing every year, and people yeah. are preferring like plant-based produce. Obviously, plant-based produce. You can, uh, for example, if if it's a millet-based or uh, there are barley-based, there are soybean-based plant products which are made to taste like meat. So even MACD or uh, KF, what, what was it, Hungry Jacks or KFC, whatever, these junk food, uh, like fast food providers, they are going for vegan based meat and the quality of such uh, patties, which, which yeah. uh, taste like meat can be improved through gene editing. Yeah, th 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 those are like really good areas to explore, like. Okay. There's, there's hope. That's good. Yeah, there is, there is, there is definitely hope. Like increasing, uh, you could, you could even add flavor to like uh, grains. What if someone wants to add a beef flavored uh, wheat grain or a barley grain, which can then be used, or a soybean, which can then be used to make patties. It's, it's vegan. It's vegetarian or it's vegan, and then, who knows? Okay. That that might be the food of the future. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, please? Are there I think any questions there are in the a few. Uh, yes. In the chat books? In Q&A books? Yeah, I think there are and two questions in the Q&A. One is how much successful has been genome editing in treating genetic disorders and diseases like cancer? which are not completely curable till now. It has been successful. There are works going on. So if you look at like, uh, I'm, I'm talking on an Australian perspective because I've seen um, it, it might be uh, the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne or the uh, Peter Doherty Institute where, where all the Lovelace Cancer Center. They are working on genome editing or CRISPR-Cas9 or CRISPR-Cas12 or 13. Uh, all those technologies, and they are developing cancer cell lines. They are developing tools which are uh, targeting cancer, but th they, they are de there are definitely tools which are um, targeting the genes that cause different cancers in cell lines. But the obvious fact is that 
some of those diseases like not cancer, but other diseases are like autoimmune diseases or generative, uh, generative diseases, regenerative diseases, which are specific to people and that needs to be studied. So personalized medicine is one kind of thing where we need to like put in more research and CRISPR could be a tool of the future where personalized medicine can work. Like my genome could, re could be definitely uh, different from another person's genome. So personalized medicine need to be uh, included in CRISPR uh, research where we can, yeah, yeah, I would say it is, it is to an extent research is happening and stem cell uh, therapy or CRISPR-Cas9 technology has been used to uh, treat such disorders. So yes. And another question is, there are many problems faced by the entrepreneur to establish their projects. Is it worthy to start dairy-based business as they need adequate financial requirements for implementation? Uh, I, so if I'm not wrong, the question is like a dairy-based business or a dairy-based gene edited business. Is that what you mean by that? If that is the case, yes, it would definitely require financial requirements. And as I said, a single person might not be able to put in the R&D investment or uh, the, the amount needed to establish a larger uh, facility. But yes, a consortia of like-minded people, if you come together, then definitely it might be small scale. It might be a, a pilot scale testing lab or a pilot scale uh, lab which can try out like smaller uh, versions of what is happening in the big companies. Yes, but if like minds come together, you can make it happen, definitely. Is RNA interference technique can be used in COVID-19? Yes, RNAi can be used, but uh, it's a bit of outdated technique. RNAi has been outdated because when CRISPR came into existence, everybody is working on CRISPR and uh, other genetic technologies. Definitely RNAi can be used in COVID-19. Is India exploring or making use of genetic engineered product in food market? Um, I would say yes and no. It's 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 a debatable question. Like, not like the other countries, but yes, there are improvements in the Indian economy and in the Indian scientific scientific community where we are putting into uh, putting our hands up in genetic engineering space. And yes. I think those were the questions in there. Yeah. One more. Oh, is there one more? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't see. Is our RNA interference technique? Yeah, I, I've, I've already answered that. Yes, yeah, RNA interference. It's, it's an outdated technique. I wouldn't say outdated, but RNA interference. Uh, so CRISPR has taken most of the space of the RNA interference because our lab used to develop uh, all these uh, genetic engineered animals or gene edited animals through RNAi technology. But once CRISPR has taken over, CRISPR has boomed and most of the research is now happening on CRISPR rather than RNAi. Yeah, but still RNAi is a technique which can be explored. But obviously people would prefer the uh, latest technique to be employed. Is CRISPR technology applicable in microalgae? Well, interesting, yeah, could be. I'm not sure because I, I, I work with animals and um, it could be, yeah. Microalgae based uh, CRISPR technology, that's worth having a read through. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but it's, it's, it's worth. One more question from an anonymous attendee. Is India exploring? Is India, um, I, yeah. I think I have answered that. Yeah, I think I have answered it. Yeah, we, we are, uh, Indian scientists are putting efforts to put genetic engineer. But in India, the problem is the acceptance and uh, the regulations that govern it. Do you think a genetically modified uh, food on table can be accepted by the Indian public? I leave it up to you. Somebody has raised hand. Is it for a question? Is this in the chat box? Can autoimmune diseases be cured by this technique? In chat box? It can. So that's where the personalized um, 
medicine I talked with, it could be uh, if you have a, a personalized treatment, like personalized medicine, yes, definitely autoimmune diseases can be treated to an extent, but I'm not sure how much uh, successful it will be, but there are uh, uh, autoimmune disease treatments. There are, there are lots of research happening in, uh, especially in, in Australia, I know people who are working on uh, uh, gene editing technologies to like find a, find an answer to autoimmune diseases. So then it says, yes, it can be. Well, I think those are the questions. Letta, I think it's over. Yep, those questions are over. And Any more questions? Any more comments? Anyone? Well, you can reach out to me anytime. Uh, Lata Miss has my details. She has my phone number. Yeah. So if you have any queries or something, just drop it to her or she can share my email ID with you. You can contact me anytime. Yeah. And obviously, yeah, like what uh, Dr. Amrita said this morning, you don't need to be into hardcore scientists. Uh, uh, scientific research to work in this field. If you're interested, well, I haven't completed my PhD yet, but I'm working on a different range of projects which um, includes all these kind of things. So yeah, like what it was said, if I can, then you can too. There, there are opportunities. So it's just that it doesn't come knocking on your door. You you need to go chase those opportunities and get get going with it. If you have, if that is something that is in, is in within you, then go for it. Anyway, thank you so much. I think I've tried to answer the questions that came up. Thank you, Kiran. You're welcome. Uh, let that means shall we wind up? Wind up the session. Vote of thanks. Okay, Bishop. Uh, now I welcome. Our student representative from First MSc Botany, Akhila Jaymon, to deliver out of thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, all. I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks in, uh, on this auspicious occasion of webinar on genome editing technologies and commercialization organized by the team Agora 2021. First and foremost, I convey my thanks to our special guest, Sri Kiran Soh, Research Project Professor in Genome Engineering, uh, who despite his uh, busy schedule and has found time to grace this occasion. So I had explained various suspects and methods of genome editing and genome engineering, and the session was really adorable for us uh, for our future studies and references. Next, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to our Honorable Principal Dr. R. Sunil Kumar for the Gogan message. I also thank Dr. S. Disha, Department of Zoology and the coordinator of Agora 2021 for all her great commitments to make this event a grand success. Now, let me thank Dr. Nisha AP, the head of the Department of Botany, and Dr. S.P. Manoj, IQAC coordinator, for the immense support. I also thank Dr. Lata Sadanandan, Assistant Professor of Department of Botany, who is a department level of coordinator of this webinar, and thanking all other uh, organizing committee members. Finally, thanking all distinguished guests, students, and teachers for your valuable time and presence. Thank you. Thank you, Akila. Thank you. Please fill the feedback form for getting the e-certificates. Kiran, that was a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was lovely to present to you all. And I, I hope people would have like really vibe things from that. Yeah, thank you. You are an inspiration to our students. They must have been inspired by oh, you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The feedback is there. Feedback form. The, all the participants are requested to fill in the feedback form. This should teacher. Kiran, thank then, you for your valuable. Kiran, we will send you a sorry, and certificate for you too. Oh, thank you. A resource person Please. certificate. Yeah, thank you. The email is the same. 
Yeah, it's with La Dames. Yeah, it's, it's the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. The same. Okay. In case there is a time I could like log off, I'll okay. stop sharing the screen. Yeah. Okay. Ah, uh, Kiran, uh, um, in the duty, Lele, in the. Lele, 